Reading, first of all, in the book of Genesis in chapter number 28. I have been told that I speak too fast. So if I'm going too fast, don't throw anything, but make some kind of signal to slow down. Okay. The goal of the meeting is edification, not stupefaction. And uh, trust God will give up. I'm going to break into Genesis 28. We'll have to give some of the background in just a moment, but for the sake of younger believers especially, but pick up at verse number 10 of Genesis 28. And Jacob went out from Beersheba. He's leaving home now. And he's probably, believe it or not, about 75 years of age. He's not a young boy. But since he lived quite a long time, he's about middle age here, halfway through his life. Went out from Beersheba, went towards Aaron. He laid it upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. Took the stones of that place, put them for his pillow, laid down in the place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on earth. The top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. Now, different versions, including the revised version, maybe a version you're reading, has the Lord stood beside it or beside him. And said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou layest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land where I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. He was afraid and said, How dreadful, or really the word is how, how awesome, how awful, how full of awe is this place. This is none other but the house of God, this is the gate of heaven. Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. Jacob vowed a vow and saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, will I surely give the tenth unto thee. Now just keep your hand there because that's the major portion. But just to see a connection, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul's letter to Timothy. A mere 1800 years later. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes in verse number 14 to Timothy. These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in house of God, which is the church of the living God, pillar and ground or bulwark of the truth. Now we know that God will add blessing to the public reading of his word. Young believers must have a grasp of the first five books of your Bible. They all present to us an increasing Revelation of the character of God and his dealings with his own. In the book of Genesis, we are dealing mainly with people, rather with persons. We have seven different personages which dot the landscape of the book, beginning with Adam, Enoch, and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is dealing with individual persons. And in his dealings with them, we learn something of the character of God and the purposes of God actually for the universe for eternity. When we come to the book of Exodus, God moves and now deals with a people, the nation of Israel. Stops, he now changes from dealing with individual persons to dealing with a people. Of course, the book of Leviticus is God dealing with a priesthood. The book of Numbers is God and pilgrims who are passing through a wilderness scene. And the book of Deuteronomy, God is seen dealing with those who are going to possess the land and pass over Jordan to go into Canaan. Also, as we were taught from earliest days in Sunday school, Genesis is the book is about a book, is the book about going down. You begin in the Garden of Eden, you end in a coffin in Egypt. Exodus is the book about going out. Leviticus is the book about going in. 
Numbers is the book about going through, and Deuteronomy is the book about going over. Very easy way to remember them, and the main themes in each of those books easily grasp just by those simple statements and that simple way of remembering the main message of each of these five books. Now, we mentioned the book of Genesis about different persons. And certainly when you think of Abraham, you are admire the courage of faith that marked Abraham and his pilgrimage for God. When you think about Joseph, you're amazed at the moral fortitude and moral character, the beauty of the man as he moves in all those different scenes of adversity and hatred and difficulty. And yet he seems to come out of them more and more straightened and useful for God in every different circumstance. A man who resembles Christ in so many ways. Isaac, like many of us, suffer from having a famous father and a famous son. And as a result, you don't think much of Isaac. A quiet life, yet the only life really that was lived totally in the land, never went out of the land. But when you think of Jacob, you think of a colorful man, a man who had many ups and downs, a man that we can identify with probably more readily than any of the other patriarchs in the Old Testament. None of us would dare think of approaching the magnitude of moral character of a Joseph or the immensity of the faith of, a, of an Abraham. But Jacob, with all of his failings, with all of his ups and downs, with all of his lessons that he learns, we can easily identify with, with a Jacob. J Jacob, as well as the man of the pillar, Abraham was the man of the altar. Abraham built altars. Isaac dug wells. And this man, Jacob, he erected pillars. We read of the first one here in Genesis chapter 28. Now, just to bring us up to date, up to speed here with where we are, there really are five houses that are linked with the life of Jacob. We have four nights. So I'm going to cram two of them in tonight. Very briefly, the first, and then comes what we have here, house of God in the land of, in, in, in Luz or Bethel, the house of God. His first house, of course, was the house in which he was raised, his father's house. We didn't read it. It was a house, you recall, where he deceived his father. He stole the birthright from his brother Esau. And when we pick up reading in chapter 28, he is fleeing for his life for fear of his brother Esau, who had threatened to take his life. When you think about the house in which he was raised, I want you to think of a failure that marked that house. It was a, first of all, a divided home. Rebecca thought she could deceive Isaac. Isaac thought he could disregard God's purposes for Jacob. And each of them are working in their own way, using deceit, using manipulation, using lies. It's a home that is marked by division, a home that was marked by, by deceitfulness, a home that, was, that put the fun back in dysfunctional. A very, very dysfunctional family. And yet, this is important to grasp. This was a marriage arranged by God. Recall how Jacob, or rather how Isaac got his bride. Abraham sent a servant a long way, and the servant prayed. The next damsel that comes out that offers me water that gives it to my camels, that's the damsel. And everything occurs just as. So here's a marriage arranged of God. And yet we see problems. So it reminds us, that's a very practical point, it reminds us that even divinely ordained marriages can have difficulty and problems that people need to work out in the fear of God in the presence of them. Just an aside here of this. Here was a home that had a distorted view of God. First of all, Rebecca and Jacob did not think they could trust God for the blessing. You might say, well, well Isaac was intent on giving the blessing to Esau. If they had not intervened, we would be privy to how God in his own miraculous way would have frustrated the purposes of Isaac and brought the blessing to Jacob as he had promised. But because they did not think God could be trusted, they took things under their own hand. They thought God could not be trusted. Jacob thought, I'm sorry, Isaac thought God could be disregarded and he could have his own way instead of, and we see as well the reality here that um, Esau thought he could, he could manipulate God with tears. He sought the blessing with many tears, but he never never had repentance. But he could manipulate God just with, with false tears. So here's a family that had a, 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 a distorted view of the character of God. What really marks a home is not so much our wealth or our gadgets or our technology. What is going to mark a home is what do we know of God? What do we brought of God into our homes? Here was a home that had a distorted view of God, and as a result, tremendous loss. Because you will see 
And we'd have to trace it. We don't have time to do it. You would trace it, could trace it. I would gather that Rebecca never saw Jacob again. When he comes back, there's no mention of, of his mother. I would gather that she died. Uh, the fact that the special nurse Deborah was sent away to, to Jacob in a far country would suggest she had died, sent her nurse away. And so she got what she wanted, but she lost everything she really loved. It reminds us of the great price of disobedience to God and of seeking my own way. So it was a, 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 mar a family marked by failure and the feelings that must have filled that house were those of partiality, of, this, of hatred, of anger. All of that was present there. But I want to come to chapter 28 and think not now of Jacob in his father's house and the, his birth there, and but now come to the house of God. Chapter 28, Jacob comes to Bethel, the house of God. God is going to use homes to teach the patriarchs valuable lessons, not just Jacob, but really we could see that Joseph was linked with five houses. Isaac was linked with houses. And so in those homes, God is going to refine, God is going to teach, God is going to prepare, God is going to enable and fit men for his purposes and for his service. So five houses that are linked with the life of, of Jacob. We mentioned one of them, his father's house, the house where he was raised. Then you come to this house, the house of, of God, Bethel, house of God. We'll look tomorrow evening in the, Lord, in the will of the Lord at Laban and his time in Laban's house. Then we will notice something of a house that he should never have built, a house in Shechem, where he went aside from God. And finally, his house down in the land of Egypt, where he ended his days. So just with that before us, I want to just emphasize three things at the time we have before us. I want to think of the revelation he received of God at Bethel, a revelation from God. Then I want you to think with me, if you will, at the implications of the name house of God. And then finally, at the affirmation of the principles linked with house of God. Now, let me just uh, kind of go to the end before we get to the beginning, really. Whenever you come across a major term in the word of God for the first time, there are truths linked with it that are vital to understand because they will never, never change. God will add to his revelation. God will increase the truth about it. But what is initially seen when God mentions an important subject for the very first time will never, never change and alter. It will be true wherever you, so wherever you find the term house of God from this moment on in scripture, what we will look at as far as the principles linked with this house will always be true and never be compromised or changed by God. So whether we're looking at the tabernacle, whether we're looking at Solomon's temple, whether we're looking at a local assembly, wherever house of God is present, these same principles will be found and will be underlined and will be emphasized. So we'll notice that as time allows. I want you to think, first of all, of the, of the revelation he received from God. Here's a man in his mid-70s. He's leaving home, and I would gather what we're looking at in Genesis 28 is, first of all, his conversion. Now, I know that it's difficult at times to pinpoint exactly where an Old Testament person's conversion occurs, but here he receives a revelation of God to his soul. I would venture to say that Jacob first heard about the God of Israel, or the God of, of heaven, the living God, at the feet of his grandfather Abraham. Now you, look, you can check the chronology. There were 15 years where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelled together in tents. So for 15 years, Jacob sat at the feet of a grandfather. And learned about the God who had appeared, the God of glory who had appeared to Abraham and Ur the Chaldees. Likely it was there that he first got his taste of I want that, I want that covenant blessing. I really want to have what my grandfather has. But you see, he had to learn God for himself. Wonderful to have grandparents. Wonderful to have parents who are godly, who have sought to please God in their lives. But every individual must learn God for himself. Not just in conversion, but in life. To learn God for myself, that he can be trusted. What he is like. And all the, all, all the beauty of his person that is unfolded to us. So Jacob here is a man who is going to get to know God for the very first time, personally and intimately, here on this occasion. So I cannot emphasize enough the, the tremendous importance 
of young believers. Yes, do not discard what your parents have taught you of God. Do not discard what your loved ones have lived before you, exemplifying the character of God, but learn God for yourself in your own experience of life. And here is Jacob learning it for the first time. There are four things, at least, that he learned of God. First of all, that heaven had an interest in a man on earth. That God actually had an individual interest in him as he came here to Bethel that day. He saw a way cast up and that there was an intimate link between heaven and earth. And the angels of God were not descending. Please notice. Angels of God were ascending. Meant they were with him. And they were ascending and descending. And beside it stood God himself. And that God had a deep personal interest in him. Personally, in every way. But then not only that. But God was investing in this man's life. God was pledging himself to be his God. God was pledging himself to, to do five times over this. God said, I will, I will, I will. Can you imagine? Here's Jacob. I think he was his heart was filled with fear. He's fleeing from his brother Esau, who was a skilled hunter and uh, not, not to be trifled with. And he's fear, fearful of his life. And to have God reveal himself in these five pronouncements of I will, I will be with you, I will keep thee, I will fulfill, I will bring. What, what a tremendous encouragement to think that God was actually investing in his life and God was interested in him. Very interesting, isn't it? Here was a man and he sees a ladder cast up to heaven. Now just go back in your Bible a few chapters. There were people who built the Tower of Babel to reach the heaven. They thought we can get, and here Jacob is finding, I have, by God's grace, was what they tried to do. And of course, remember, they wanted to make themselves a name. And God gave Abraham a name by grace. So God is teaching us in Abraham and in Jacob that what men sought with their foolish efforts to attain, God gives by grace. God gives in his kindness and his goodness. A way cast up to heaven and a, a relationship with heaven. He is learning as well that God has an intention for him. God has a purpose for his life. Now, I know this is a special man, Jacob. A very special individual, one of the patriarchs from whom the nation will spring. But could I just impress on young believers? Those of us who are older, we're past it already. If we haven't picked up on this truth, it's too late. But for you young believers, could I just impress on you? God has a purpose for your life. God has an intention for you. He's got a goal for you. And he wants you to be on target with it and to jo join with him in what that is. And of course, then we get an intimacy. We get a glimpse, rather, of the intimacy of, of God with a man. I will be with thee. I will never. This same promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, five times in your Bible, occurs here. It occurs to uh, a people in the book of Deuteronomy about to pass over into an entirely new world, an entirely new venture, facing enemies they never faced before, facing difficulties they never faced. It's repeated to Joshua as a, as a leader that he is going to have to know something of this too in his leadership, the presence of God. It's mentioned to uh, Solomon, is he about to build for God? And of course, the last time it's in Hebrews 13, to a persecuted people, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we're reminded of a God who is intimate, a God who is near, a God who is faithful, a God who has promised all. And so here's a man, he is learning God for himself. He is learning from this revelation what God is like. And he's going to be able to live in the good of it from that moment forward. Let me just come quickly because I want to talk about the implications of a name. The house of God. Now we mentioned the truth of the law of first dimension. And we mentioned, we read as well, First Timothy chapter 3. We are not the assembly here, the assembly I am associated with. We are not the house of God. We have house of God character. We carry house of God character. So what does that mean? What are the implications of the name? First of all, ownership. Ownership. The assembly is not mine. Somebody is, is the Lord's house of God, ownership. Now, what that means is, of course, it's not what I want. It's not what I think is best. It's not how I think things should go. It's his word, his will. All of that is revealed to us. It is house of God. Ownership is his. So it is his word that is paramount, his word that dictates. Unfortunately, now, some may disagree with me. You can talk to me later on. Unfortunately, we have moved to user-friendly churches. 
making everyone feel comfortable, making everyone feel like they belong, making uh, people, now I'm not against outreach, and, but the main purpose of an assembly, now I say this carefully, the main purpose of an assembly is not even the blessing of the believers. As house of God, the main purpose of the assembly is to honor God and glorify him. We read there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that an assembly is pillar and ground of truth. What's the truth we are, what's the truth we are preserving? What's the truth we are proclaiming? It's all about Christ. We are here to uphold Christ to the eye of his Father. You say, where do you find that in the Bible? But let me go back for a moment. You recall in the tabernacle, in the holy place, there was a lampstand. And men love to wax eloquent on how the lampstand speaks of Christ. And he does. And all of its beauty and all of its radiance and all of its glory. Who saw the lampstand? The nations didn't see. The people around the tabernacle didn't see. The lampstand was for the pleasure and heart of God. He saw it. Burning every day in his presence for his eye to enjoy so the main purpose of an assembly really is to uphold Christ for the pleasure of his Father. So we proclaim Christ, we preach Christ, we, we teach Christ. Our goal is to, to draw people to Christ. And so the main purpose, it's his assembly, it's, it's, it's house of God. Ownership is his. But likewise, reminds us of occupancy. He's the occupant. He's taken up residence. Now, Sometimes it's asked, you know, you say the Lord is here in the midst, but isn't he omnipresent? Isn't God everywhere? Isn't the Lord everywhere? The Lord was everywhere, and yet he came down to walk with Adam in the cool of the day. The Lord is everywhere, yet he came down and dwelt in the tabernacle. The cloud came down and filled the tabernacle. The Lord is everywhere, yet he came down and dwelt the temple that Solomon built. You see, there's a big difference between his omnipresence and his confirming presence. Say that again. He is omnipresent. Yet he takes up residence with people or with assemblies where local companies where he approves of what is happening, what is of the structure. And so he takes up his residence there. The occupancy that marked him here. So that means we must maintain conditions conducive to his presence. We must maintain conditions that honor him and glorify him. So there is ownership, there is occupancy, and of course there is always, in every house, you always think about order, don't you? Order. It's not chaos. Maybe in some houses, but hopefully not the, not the goal of most homes to be marked by chaos. We think about order in a home. And of course there needs to be order in an assembly. Now the best way to get rid of something that an assembly does is to call it a tradition. You know, just, just one of the traditions of the assembly. That's all. It's just all tradition. Well, let me just remind you that there are three kinds of traditions spoken of in the Bible. There is bad tradition. The Lord Jesus spoke of that. And you can always tell when he spoke of it because he spoke about the tradition of the elders, the tradition of the fathers, the tradition of the Jews. And what those traditions did, they either contradicted the word of God, they compromised the word of God, or they canceled the word of God. So they set the word of God aside. Those were bad traditions. Then there are biblical traditions. Paul speaks about the fact that they kept their traditions as he handed them down. He speaks in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If anyone doesn't keep these traditions, he has to be dealt with in discipline. Tradition just meant something handed down. Now, before this book was inscribed and written, it was all word of mouth teaching. So the word of mouth teaching was handed down to the next generation. They didn't have a Bible to refer to initially. So tradition just meant teaching that was handed down from all to Timothy, Timothy to the next generation. Those were biblical traditions. Now we have them written for us in the word of God, and they are now precepts that we have to follow. So there are bad traditions, there are biblical traditions, and then there are beneficial traditions. What kind of beneficial traditions? Well, you know that the meeting tonight was at 730. You may say, well, that's what we've always said. That's just one of the traditions. Well, that's fine. If you want to make a meeting at 7, once you've had your second meeting at 7 o'clock, you've begun a new tradition. You have, you have to face the fact that there needs to be order, and we call some of those things traditions, and they're all changing. Those kinds of traditions are changeable according to the needs of the assembly, and the way we sit, perhaps, whether we have two rows, three rows, uh, all of the, 
order is vital and necessary. And of course, the ultimate order is don't sit in somebody else's seat. Right? <laughs> you never want to do that. You really are in trouble if you sit in somebody else's seat. But you'll understand when I say when order and the obligation and how one ought to behave. We are obligated as far as our behavior. Not a, not a matter of option, not a matter of our own personal liberty. But I want to come to the affirmation of the principles that are mentioned here in chapter 28. The first thing I want you to notice is it was mercy and not merit that brought Jacob to that place. So let me just quickly make connect the dots. None of us deserves to be part of the house of God. It is absolute mercy of God that any one of us is linked with an assembly of believers, that any one of us has a place in the house of God. Jacob, a deceiver, a liar, a cheat, he's fleeing for his life. And yet God in mercy brings him to the house of God. Now, I'm not suggesting that we be marked by lying and cheating. and maybe, unless, I'm just reminding us, uh, ourselves of this. That every time you come into an assembly meeting, the first thing you should do is thank God that you're able to be there. Not just physically and healthy enough to get there, but that I actually have a place. I actually have a place. Do you ever sit at a Lord's Day on a morning and look around the circle and think, imagine I have a place with these people. You look back at your past. Think of what it was like. Think of, think of what, I'm not saying we get morbidly occupied with our sins and our failure, but just to think that God actually brought me from there to here. It's mercy and not merit that, that brings us to where we are today. And likewise, we are in the house of God just by God's grace and by God's goodness. His mercy and his merit. But then I want you to think about residency and reverence. God is in this place. This is an awesome place. So that God's residency in the midst of his people should then cause me to act in reverence. Now, please don't have a panic attack, start sweating, and get very nervous. I'm not going to talk about how you should dress. You know, you need a two-piece seat with a matching tie and a white shirt, and no. Tragically, though, because we have developed a more casual attitude in life in general, we think the idea of reverence is outdated. You know, they would say in the, in the world, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you think you're gener the generation before you was legalistic and you just can't abide that, make sure that in the presence of God, you work out what reverence means for you. Don't reject the idea of reverence altogether. The principle of reverence is taught in the New Testament as well as in the Old. Jacob realized God is in this place. This is awesome. The word awful, really, we, we use it in the wrong way. The word awful means full of awe. That's what Jacob thought. This place is full of awe. God is here. And I, I, I just have to watch how I behave. So that the presence of God should dictate. The residency of God should create in me a sense of reverence for his presence. Now, we're not going to go back to when we tiptoed into meeting and people never spoke before meeting. Everybody was there 20 minutes early. And, and you know, I think those days are gone. Wouldn't be bad if they came back, but they're gone. But still, in the presence of God, work out for your own soul. How can I display reverence? In the house of God. Because it is fitting and worthy of the God to whom I have come to meet with. So residency and reverence. Authority and administration. Where do you get that? Jacob says, this is the gate of heaven. Now, most of us would probably read that and think Jacob is saying, this is the way into heaven. I see the ladder cast up and it's the way into heaven. This is the gate of heaven. But that's not the way the Old Testament speaks about a gate. You recall that Lot sat in the gate, Solomon. That Abraham, when he wanted to buy the field from Ephron the Hittite, he went to the gate. Remember that when Boaz wanted to purchase Ruth the Moabite to be his wife, he called the elders to the gate of the city. The gate was the place of administration. The gate was the place where decisions were made, where judgment was carried out, where the ten elders of the city would... Uh, legislate for the city and the, the inhabitants and so on. So the gate is a place of administration and authority. So Jacob realizes, I have lived my life according to my own way up to this point in time. But now the administration of my life is from heaven. 
What is the authority in the administration of a local assembly? You say it's the elders. With all due respect to the oversight here, I think they would agree. The authority in the, in the assembly is the word of God. It is administered through those who are given the place of leadership. That's why leadership is such a tremendous responsibility to undertake. We profess to be able to speak for God, to represent God, and to give you the mind of God. Tremendous responsibility. But the word of God is the ultimate authority in our assembly. And so here we find a place of authority and administration. God's word through the leadership of the assembly, and as a result then, God's word is what controls everything that goes on. Not human convenience, not opinions, not expediency, but the truth of God. So there is merit, sorry, mercy and not merit, residency and reverence, authority and administration. Notice here as well what happens. There's consecration and commitment. Consecration and commitment. He builds a pillar, pours a drink offering, makes his vow. This is the first vow in the word of God. He makes a vow here so that he is going to be faithful to the house. Now, let me just inject a note of caution. If we were to go over to 1 Kings chapter 6, Solomon is found building a house for God. It, it's spoken of as being exceeding magnificent, and it was a magnificent edifice, likely worth millions of dollars, if not more, in today's currency, considering all the gold that was involved in its building. But God interrupts the strings. God interrupts the building. Solomon is building away. It tells us what he's doing, and then says, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. The word of the Lord came to Solomon. And you know what God is doing? God is telling Solomon, Solomon, if your heart is not right, the house will not keep you right. Solomon, the house is only as good as the heart. And you've got to be faithful. You've got to obey. You've got. So what I'm learning is this. We can get taken up with form and fail to realize the fact of our own spiritual condition. Not enough just to come and go from meetings. Not enough just to be wonderful of your presence. Thank God for that. Do keep at it. But the most important thing is the condition of my heart. Am I in fellowship with God as well as in fellowship with the believers? And am I right with God? Because if a heart is not right, then it doesn't really help to be in the house. The house won't make your heart right. And so Solomon is reminded of the need of consecration and of commitment. So that an assembly should not just be a matter of convenience. It shouldn't be a matter that just I have connections there. Now, thank God that God does reach families and save families and link people together. It's wonderful. But yet, I should be committed to the assembly because it is where he is. He has drawn my heart to it. And I should be committed to him entirely. So not, not a matter of convenience, not a matter of connection, but convictions and commitment. Paul is going to tell Timothy in several places in his two letters to him that really full, full commitment to the assembly, to the things of God, is vital if the assembly is going to be able to prosper and continue as God intends it to continue. So consecration and commitment. God's presence and God's promise. You would have to go to Galatians, and we don't want to necessarily turn to it right. You have to go to Galatians to find that when God said, in thy seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'm not sure how much Jacob understood. But Jacob was getting a revelation of the coming Christ. Paul will tell him in Galatians, he didn't say seeds, he said seed as a Christ. So that in, in the house of God, where the, the presence of God is enjoyed, the prospects of God are enjoyed. The prospects are, are laid before us in the house of God character. And Jacob here is getting a, a revelation of God, a, a, a revelation of Christ that had not yet been given. In fact, Jacob, you will have to come on Friday night if you're able to come. And notice that Jacob gives five revelations of Christ at the end of his life, never given before. Jacob is the man who gives us more fresh unfoldings of Christ than Abraham, than, I mean, J Joseph in his life. But as far as prophecy or words that he said, it's really Jacob who unfolds more of Christ to us than any other of the patriarchs. And here he is getting a, a fresh, unique picture of Christ 
as the sea is going to end, end up blessing the entire globe. All of that in the presence of God that day. The presence of God and the prospects before him. But then with this revelation, there comes responsibility. I've touched on that a bit. Let me just emphasize. Whenever God reveals something in his word, it makes me now responsible for what I do with it. God does not reveal truth haphazardly or just to entertain us. When God reveals something, he expects responsibility to follow. So let me just mention quickly, time is going, just some of the responsibilities that are linked with house of God. You've already mentioned fervent consecration to God. Jonathan Edwards, 1700s, mid 1700s. He said, resolution number one, resolve number one, I will live for God no matter what. Resolution number two, if no one else does, I will still live for God no matter what. Total unrelenting, uncompromising consecration to God. Now, if you want to know how you can be useful for God, you have got to go back to Romans chapter 12. You say, oh, we've heard that all the time. But what follows that, what follows those first verses relative to presenting your bodies a living sacrifice and yielding yourself to God? What follows next is usefulness for God, gift or abilities, and then graces to mark us in our dealings with each other, so that my usefulness for God, my blessing to the believers, it all begins at the beginning of chapter 12 with consecration, with yieldingness, with commitment. So fervent, full consecration to God. But I also suggest full commitment to the gatherings of the Lord's people. Now I know that families sometimes have small children so that attendance at the meetings during the week is divided between husband and wife and so on and younger children kept at home and so forth. And with schedule, sometimes it's difficult. But when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, you could say when the whole church become together, when, when the whole church is gathered together, I would gather that the Spirit of God never anticipated intentional absences from the assembly gatherings. I say that trying to word my, word, word my statement carefully. The Spirit of God never intended intentional absences, that I could be there, but I choose not to be. Now, of course, in first century Christianity, the believers were so persecuted and uh, so driven towards each other that it would be only natural, you might say, that they would want to be together. But our affluence, our ease and lifestyle, unfortunately, have compromised all of that and I think in some places I don't think it's here judging by the attendance in some places people prefer to stay at home and stream the meeting rather than be present much more convenient much more comfortable you know nobody's here in their pajamas I think but uh, if you were home on watching it on zoom you'd all be in your pajamas with your cup of coffee or whatever it is and relaxed and said you're sitting up erect trying to keep awake despite me and all the rest but uh, a full commitment to the gatherings of the assembly. Someone has said his presence forbids my absence. And that should mark us all as much as possible. So a full commitment to, what about a flawless testimony in godliness? A flawless testimony in godliness. You represent the assembly at school, at work, in the neighborhood. It's like putting on a uniform and as wearing that uniform, you represent your country. There's an anecdote that's told about Alexander the Great, that um, he was very stern in the discipline of his soldiers. And someone reported to him a soldier who was had fallen asleep or had done something that was totally out of character for one of Napoleon, one of his soldiers, Alexander's soldiers. And uh, they brought this man to Alexander the Great. First thing Alexander said to him, soldier, what is your name? He said, my name is Alexander. He says, either change your name or change your conduct. So either had to change his name, couldn't be an Alexander and live that kind of a life, or he had to change his conduct. 
linked with the Lord Jesus, we, we don't want to change our name, but we do want to change our conduct. We want to live so as to represent him and to give honor to him. So a fervent testimony of godliness, before, I'm sorry, a flawless testimony of godliness before the world. And that doesn't mean perfection. It just means I live consistent with what I have professed. I, I live a life before them that is in keeping with what I have told them I am and what I'm associated with. You represent the assembly in every sphere of your life and every activity of your life. And then a fragrant life of growth. God is looking for growth in a believer. This is going to mark the very beginning of growth in the life of this man, Jacob. He's going to have lots of ups and downs. But from this moment on, he is going to begin to grow until finally you come to chapter 49 of the book of Genesis. And here is a man who has grown for God in such a way that he eclipses many, many others in the word of God at the end of his life. He, he exits life in full bloom, if I could call it that, has, in the very best of conditions. But he's going to begin here. He's going to make a vow, and God is going to be his God from this moment on. He's going to seek to honor God in his life, give the tenth back and so on, recognize I have an obligation, I have an indebtedness to God from this moment on, and he's going to seek to grow and live for God. Now, growth does not occur by osmosis. Growth does not occur just because you come to meetings. Come to meetings, but growth doesn't occur that way. Growth is going to be something that occurs in your individual personal life with God. As you read the word of God, as you speak to God. So growth is vital. Remember the Lord, remember it says concerning the Lord Jesus as a perfect servant. His ear was opened morning by morning to hear as an instructed one. It was personal. It was his ear open to hear, not his parents, not his Sunday school teacher, not the preachers, not the elders. My ear is open morning by morning. He opens my ear. And then it was something that was very practical. Opens my ear to hear. I, I, I want to take it in. And it was something that was a practice morning by morning. I had priority every morning. Now, I don't know what your pattern of life is, whether you're an ark or a lap, but now, whether you get up early in the morning, whether you stay up late at night, but time spent with the word of God is, I'm going to say it's vital, more than vital. It's, it's life sustaining. You may say, well, I, I've got schoolwork, I'm busy. I think there are people in the audience here who know what it is to be busy. And yet, they manage to make time for God. You're not going to find time to read your Bible. You won't find it. You have to make it. And it may mean sacrificing. It may mean, I hate to say, a video game or two. It may mean a few checks on social media. Those things have to be jettisoned that I can find time, make time to read God's word. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ when he was tempted by Satan. Gospel of Matthew. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. His ear was tuned to hear what God said. And he was more concerned, please get this, he was more concerned in that temptation with what came out of God's mouth than what went into his mouth. It didn't matter, he didn't care about the bread, he cared about what came out of God's mouth. Am I more concerned with what comes out of God's mouth than what I satisfy myself with. He was a man. From this moment on in his life, he is going to make it. It's going to make a big change. There is going to be growth marking him for God. House of God conditions, fragrant growth. One other thing. Here in the house of God, we don't have it here with Jacob, but I have a responsibility for the fruitful development of my gift. Whatever ability God has given me to do, I have a responsibility to seek to develop it and use it for him both brothers and sisters, both male and female, you have a role to fill in the assembly. You have a, a place to play in the great work of God, and you are responsible to fulfill it. They say, well, I pray a lot about what my gift is. I talk a lot about what it is. I've spoken to the elders. I've talked to preachers. I wish you knew what my gift is. Could I just suggest to you that that's going about it the wrong way? When the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to make 11 apostles who would turn the world upside down with their preaching, First thing he said to them was, follow me. I will make you. You follow me, and I'll make you what I intend you to be. So I learned there the primary responsibility of a believer. If they want to be useful for God, 
want to be of service for God in his assembly or in a wider sphere. First thing is follow Christ. And he'll take care of making you what he wants you to do. It's his responsibility, not yours. He'll make it clear, and then your responsibility is to develop it, to use it for his glory, but he will make you what he wants you to be. So forget all the struggle, the perspiration, the inspiration. Just follow, get your eye on Christ. Follow him. Become more like Christ, and you will find it's impossible for you not to fit in to God's program somewhere. So a fragrant, a fruitful development of my gift for God. One other thing to mention here, we mentioned mercy and not merit. We mentioned residency and reverence, authority, administration, consecration and commitment, revelation, responsibility. Notice one other thing here about the house of God. It's always true. There was angelic attendance and appreciation. Angels of God ascending and descending upon the ladder. You say, what do angels have to do with a local assembly? Well, I think I read somewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But this calls on a woman to have a sign of authority on her head because of the neighbors. Because of people looking for the gospel hall, and if they see a woman with a hat on, they'll know that's God's GPS that's going to take us to the hall. No. Because of the angels. Why would angels have an interest in sisters having their heads covered? Well, we have to go back 12 chapters, Genesis 16. The first place we hear an angel speak is to a slave girl by the name of Hagar. She's running from her mistress. And the angel says, return and submit. Why are angels so interested in submission? There was a day, I guess it was a day, I'm not sure how you measure these things. There was, there was a time when Satan and a third of the angels in heaven refused to submit. They rebelled. They had seen the, the, the sapphire throne. They had seen the glory of God in some, in some way. And yet, despite all of that, despite seeing all the glories of heaven, all the glory of God displayed from the throne, they chose to rebel. Now, angels are looking on at sisters, even though they have never seen the throne of God even though they never had a glimpse of the majesty of that throne, because the word of God tells them to do it, they willingly submit to display the headship of Christ, the headship of the man, the headship of Christ in a local assembly. And angels look on in amazement at those who willingly and intelligently are willing to veil their heads to show their submission in a local company of believers. Angelic attendance and angelic administration. Ephesians chapter 3, I know it's the, 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 the church in general, but God is making known through the church to angels something of the wisdom and, and, and ways of God. Angels are looking on to think how God has taken rebel sinners and made them willing to submit intelligently and voluntarily to the word of God. And angels who are high and mighty chose to rebel. And angels look on with wonder at our sisters. So take courage from them. It's not, not just a, an ornament you're wearing on your head. It's not just a custom of the assembly. It's not just something that we do because Corinth was marked by immoral women who didn't cover it. No, no. Paul doesn't ever bring up anything about the, the society, the customs of the day. The, he just says because of the angels. Because of the angels looking on. Angelic attendance and the appreciation of angels for the submission of those who gather as we do to the Lord's name. So just very quickly then, we are as an assembly. Jacob erected a pillar. I think first pillar in the scripture. We are pillar and ground of truth. As pillar, we uphold the truth. As bulwark, we protect the truth. And the best way to protect truth is to publish the truth, to proclaim the truth. And we seek to maintain it in faithfulness to the Lord Jesus in his absence until he comes. So trust some lessons from Bethel, the house of God, the, not just now the place where he was born, but the place where he was born again, the beginning of his life with God.